Hugh, it's Ryan. Um, I know you got Claire uh, today for the interview, which is going to be great. I, I just love her, and I, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to hear that. Anyway, uh, the reason I'm calling, though, other than to wish you good luck, you know how you're always saying, hey, we should get you singing on the podcast a little bit more? Um, hang on, am I saying that or are you saying that? One of us is always saying that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I thought it's weird if Ryan Shelton sings songs on the podcast, but it's not weird if Shelton John sing songs on the podcast, right? <laughs> okay, so hang on, I'm putting the phone down. I'm at the piano. Okay, um, so obviously this is just a uh, WIP, but um, a work in progress. Um, Shelton John, Shelton John, Shelton John, oh baby. So yeah, like I said, uh, work in progress. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts on uh, Shelton John's new uh, track. Uh, Got to work on some lyrics, obviously. But um, <laughs> good luck with Claire. Uh, definitely call me back about that, about that Shelton John thing. Cool. See you. To call back, press two two to replay message. Press one to reply. Press two to send a copy. Press three. We're all imperfect, and on this podcast. I'll be chatting with a variety of interesting people who are willing to make themselves vulnerable by sharing their own struggles and imperfections. Then we'll discuss the invaluable takeaways we can all apply to our own imperfect lives. I'm Hugh Van Kylenberg from The Resilience Project. And I'm Ryan Shelton from My Mum. And this is The Imperfects. Righto, welcome back to the Imperfects podcast. Sorry, it's been a, a little while uh, between drinks at Georgia Gardner. It was the last episode and uh, we had... Where the hell have we been? Yeah, it's a good question. It's been ages. It has. I feel a bit bad about that. I've had a few people really at me mm. about yeah, one. Like, the there's next... no real big reason. Well, I think the three of us have been really busy. Yeah, that's actually true. There's a lot happening. Yeah, that's a good reason. <laughs> There's that's a lot good. happening. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think people, when they do podcasts, they kind of release them weekly or yeah. bi-weekly and we just... F the rules, man. <laughs> <laughs> we just take convention and throw it out the window. We do. We do. But we apologize for that sort of about a month delay. But as um, people, keen listeners will know, it was actually your episode. was ne- It was actually meant to be next. Yep. Um, and we, which we have recorded, but it was such a mess that it's taking so long to edit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, it's, just, that's not. it's like, well, this is a new record for ums and ahs that we have to remove. <laughs> it's been no, sent no, off no. to the experts. Ah, uh, this has gone straight to Lucas Sound. <laughs> it's a Lucas Sound, Skywalker Sound. Yeah, <laughs> too much for Josh to handle. It's too much. No, that's not why. So the the reason was um, your episode. We were, we were really keen to conclude. Series well, particularly I was very keen to conclude season one with your episode because I think it's a, a great way to round out the conversations we've been having. Um, recently, we we um, we were in touch with um, Claire Bowditch, Bowditch, Bowditch. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, you're the one who's spoken to her twice. I have. <laughs> well, I <laughs> put that on the list of things that we should have looked up before we recorded the episode. <laughs> Well, I was going to bring this up later. This might actually be a good time to bring up this story. Yeah. I um, I was worried about how to pronounce her surname when she was coming in to do the yeah. interview. And then I remembered that a few years ago, she invited me onto her show. She was a, she used to host, um, she's on the ABC. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And she had like a lunchtime show and she invited me on the show. And I'm sitting there waiting to go in. I never met her before. <laughs> right. And I'm sitting there waiting to go in. <laughs> And they had to scrap a segment before mine. And all of a sudden they said, oh, Hugh, just come in, you're on next. And we came back from a song and she was really nice, like really warm greeting, lovely person. Yeah. But didn't have a chance to say, sorry, can I just check how to pronounce your name? And so I saw oh, a look, so I, saw, I just saw the look of panic on her face when she looked at the monitor as we were live. Yeah. And she said, hi, everyone, welcome back. That was so-and-so. And she said, anyway, I'm really lucky to be joined by Hugh and she just this look oh, no. of terror. And just, she said, just Hugh. And she said, she should have left it there, but she said, she instead of Van Kylenberg, she said, cycling bird. <laughs> <laughs> and I have had that many variations, but cycling bird was just, and as I was sitting there, one of my very good mates, who's a, he's actually a surgeon and he was clearly wasn't busy at the time, but uh, within 
my phone was right next to me within um, within I don't know thirty seconds of her saying that this photo message <laughs> popped up and it was just a bird riding a bike. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, that was very impressive. That is um, very fast. Yeah. So then I was thinking, I don't remember. Is it, anyway, I think it's Claire Bowditch. No. Nah, okay. Even, anyway, let's just say Claire. Yeah. So CB. Um, so <laughs> so Clary B. <laughs> I'll tell you I, another one. This is an even better one. I won't say which football coach because I don't want to. That's not fair to him, but. Um, in the year when I was doing lots of NRL, NRL and AFL football clubs, I went to one of the AFL doing your talks. One of the NRL AFL clubs, yeah, doing my talks. Yeah, and um, the coach was talking to one of the players when I got introduced to him, and he was quite deep in conversation. He turned mm. around and and I said, "Oh, this is Hugh. He's going to do the talk." The guy introduced, and he goes, "Good stuff, Stu." And then he went to turn back to the he turned back to he turned back to the <laughs> turned back to the guy, and I said, and I knew he had to introduce me. So I'm yeah. oh, no, sorry, mate. It's Hugh, and he goes, "Yep, good on you, Stu." And then I went, yeah, no, no. Hedges versus I'm Stewie boy. Yeah. All good. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Stu Van Cyclenburg. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I sort of went, sorry, mate. No, Hugh was in like, um, and I kind of, and I said, is in Hugh Jackman. And he goes, oh, right. Who's Stu Jackman? <laughs> I know Hugh Jackman. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, right. Good one, mate. And then he turned around. He's very nice, but he turned back to his player. And then the player went and sat down and he had to introduce me. And he goes, anyway, boys. Uh, special guest in today and he turned and looked at me and it was just another it was the same look that Claire gave me just this look of like yeah. oh god and he, you could see the Hugh Jackman thing pop into his head and he goes this is Jack um, <laughs> <laughs> so but I think he got away with it because I didn't go sorry mate no no it's actually I just went okay and I just did the talk as Jack Jack so they still, <laughs> they still think you're Jack no nah, no one was really like it was a he sort of mumbled it and he kind of Jack Jackman Jack Jackmanberg. <laughs> anyway, we're so far off topic. Um, so Claire, so Claire got in touch, uh, yeah. and oh, she and, interviewed you, and but like the because with your with your name, I just wanted just to add in that when someone calls me on my phone, um, it's the there's a voice that says the name. So if oh. my earphones are in and my phone's in my pocket, it says the name out, out loud, like some voice. And the way that the, the woman, the kind of computer woman says your name is Hugh Van Kuhlenberg. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, Kuhlenberg. You've called me that sometimes. That's why. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, it's you. because of the woman. That's nice. Yeah. There you go, Josh. It's great. So it's Kuhlenberg, just yeah, Josh, Van Hugh Kuhlenberg. Van, yeah, that's it. Speaking of, you, um, Stu, have a book <laughs> out. This is Book Week. It is Book Week. We've been talking about this bloody book for a couple of months and yeah. the day is here. And I know all too well because I've now signed, I said, someone said to me, why don't we pre-sign everyone who, so everyone who pre-orders a book, yeah. we should sign it. And I said, that's a lovely idea. I'll actually write a little message. And we, so we said we'd do that on the website. And then I mm -hmm. thought mum and dad would probably get one. Josh yeah. might, but, uh, but that'd People be bad. Want that. Yeah, but we had, it's about 500 and it takes that's, a long time to write them. Well, anyway. I mean, I, you, you were um, brave enough to send me like the first chapter um, yeah. When before it was finished, just yeah. to sort of get, I guess, some some thoughts. Um, and it is so. I mean, for, I'm I'm saying this to people now, not to you, because I've I've already said this to you, Stu. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, it is so so great, and I'm I'm just so excited for people to read to read it. I mean, I've only read the first chapter, but it is so. It's really amazing, and I, well, I'm I was, just looking forward to people. Thank you for that. I, it. I was I was very worried the first chapter was way too heavy, and that's why I sent it to you. And I just said, "Is this too much?" But you were um, very kind with your feedback. So anyway, yeah. it's 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 awesome. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I can't a, it was wait a to nice get my free copy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not signing it. I've had enough of it. I'll 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 put you to sleep somehow and use your hand to sign it because I just got to have a signed copy. <laughs> no, I can sign it. That's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, if it's a. Um, yeah, quite quite a journey. It's been a, a um, I we agreed to do it, and then I, I didn't quite understand the physical and mental toll it would take on me. And it's been a big six mm. months, and I'm um, exhausted from it. And tonight, actually, I go straight to convention center to do our launch, and I'm excited about it, but also nervous because it's a it's a people would say, yeah, he makes himself very vulnerable when he does his talks, but I feel like this is a whole new level. I'd, I would agree, even just from that first the first chapter. I mean, I've seen your talk obviously and, and know you, but. It happens. I guess it's, it's the point of writing a book like that, where yeah. you, you kind of get to know a side of someone and inf you, you know stuff about someone that you never really knew. Yeah. And even though I knew bits and pieces, to see it all written out just so well, like it is, it's it's pretty powerful. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you for that. Josh is in the book as well. <laughs> oh yeah. He's he's a uh, actually the story of when he went on a date with my wife. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, come on, I'm looking forward. And which chapter am I in? I can't wait to read. I'm going to scan the book for my name. What chapter is it, though, just so I can jump to it? <laughs> I think it's going to be in the sequel. I think that's the... Oh, God. Ryan Van Coolenberg. Uh, Ryan Van Coolenberg. <laughs> We're getting married. <laughs> Ryan Van Cool. Gee, I've really jumped the gun there. Okay. Well, cards are on the table. You know why I'm here. <laughs> anyway, moving on from the book. Thanks for bringing it up, though. I no, appreciate pleasure. That. I did ask you too, but. <laughs> long way around to just simulate myself. Uh, now, no, but the, so Claire, Claire Bowditch, Bowditch. Yeah. Um, we really should have figured out what that was. Yeah. I worked out what that was. Um, it's so. She is incredible. I mean, like the li- I didn't really know much about her life. I've met Claire a handful of times over the years. Very um, successful musician. Um, very successful, incredible musician. And I've I've just met her briefly, and it's been like a quick hi and a quick thing. And she's just always so lovely. And look, once again, you never know someone until you really and they make themselves vulnerable like they, like she has here and in her book, which is out. It is an amazing story and it's pretty like the life that she's lived, especially when she was younger, is just something that you you really cannot understand unless you've you've been through something like that, I think. Yeah. But the way that she talks about it and, the, you know, she's clearly come a long way now, it's... It's amazing. Yeah, so she she was it, it is, and she was originally lined up to be in our second series, um, but her her book we just sort of so timely with her book coming out now, and mm. had the opportunity to interview her. Well, it was a couple of weeks ago now, and we just mm. sort of jumped at it. So that's why we, 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 as I said before, we want your episode to come last. So we've sort of squeezed her in now. So apologies for people who are tuning in to hear Ryan's story. Uh, that'll come um, uh, in a few weeks' time. Um, but yeah, she makes us, I mean, her, her, um, publisher sent me the book so I could read it, but I only had a few days before I interviewed her. And so I only got halfway through and it wasn't a great place to be at when she walked in because it was the deepest, darkest, most horrifying part of the book that was just, and then I had to close it and put it down because she literally walked into the studio and I was just very happy to see her. Yeah. That she's she's okay. yeah, Yeah. Um, so, but it's a, it's a, um. I loved the interview. She's an incredibly warm and bubbly and energetic person. Yeah. But she covers some – I mean, we chatted about this on the phone a couple of hours ago. Just um, what she covers and what she talks about, I think will many people will, will relate to it. With the rates of anxiety in this country right now, mm. so many people will relate to her story. Mm-hmm. But what's really powerful also is that she talks about the way she worked her way through um, her struggles. Yeah. So, well, here's Claire. Enjoy. Can I be a fascination? Well, I, um, your people sent me a copy of your book uh, a couple of weeks ago. My mates. Yeah, oh, I was your mates, was it? Okay. My new best mates. You okay. know, when you write a book with people, oh, yeah. uh, you start off hardly knowing each other and then by the end you just, you know, Very. drunk texting them at 3am just to, just to tell them how much you love them. That's, <laughs> that's what it's like with my publisher. What about it's yours? It's a good relationship. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, I don't have any drunk, drunk messages yet. but Yeah, I don't drink either. No. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry. Oh, it's too much. I've gone too. I've gone too hard too early. <laughs> you can cut out whatever you want. To remember, <laughs> That's right. no, nothing. I'm not cutting out anything. They've given me a lot of coffee, friends. So, we, we, be, Josh makes a nice coffee. He does. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Um, I I have felt so privileged. To, I was just explaining to you before. I haven't finished the book. I'm I'm halfway through, and I was sitting. I told. I mentioned this before, but I was sitting in a cafe. In, speed reading skills in, weren't quite up to form. I can't they? do that. I can't speed read. I just can't do that. So I, I need to reread paragraphs and reread pages. I do it's just the, the same. way. I'm, okay, that exactly makes you feel better. Yep. But I, um, I, I, I'm just this funny image of, of from from Monday of me sitting in a cafe in Fairford. I've just been doing a bit of gardening, so I had my blundstones on and my flannelette shirt, and Looking I'm like sitting the, there with your book, having a, a strong latte, and I am weeping. Oh, I'm just. Wow. Uh, I got through. I read the first theory, four chapters. That. Yeah, it was, I was I was four chapters in, and the and I was um, I was very emotional, and I felt I felt honoured 
to be reading your story, I think, is that, well, it was just it felt like a privilege. It really was. And I, um, no, Did I, I was, say too much? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you said, it was just what you said was beautiful. And I, I um, for so many reasons, it really resonated with me. And I, I think, I, you know, we all go through trauma in life. We all experience trauma and some people, you know, it's, you never know what's around the corner, but for mm. you, your trauma had happened at a, at a really vulnerable age. You're five years old and, yeah. and you went through something, um, which I think trauma almost doesn't do it justice. I think it's, a, I think look, what, what we're chatting about here is something that a lot of humans go through, which is the loss of a sibling. So in our family, um, I'll just give you some context, um, cause it's something that you might've, if you know my music, you might've heard me refer to once or twice in the past. If you know my album, what was left, you know, that was the beginning of me trying to talk about it publicly, but um, I'm the youngest of five. We were all born 18 months apart. My mum's from Holland. My dad's from Elwood. And we were a pretty normal family growing up in Sandy. Um, we were a bit more Catholic than the average bear, but <laughs> besides that, you know, we were a fun Catholic. Um, and, you know, because I didn't realise that there was it was anything unusual with, you know, the the way we were existing in the world. You know, my parents said... We, it was a good family. We had a good dog, Sam, and my parents had just built their first house and things were on track. And um, my sister, Rowie, who's 18 months older than me, suddenly became unwell, really deeply unwell. And, you know, they couldn't find out what it was. And she moved into the children's hospital eventually after six months of being undiagnosed and um, lived in there on life support. Um, she could only move her head really, and her face, and she was so alive and so brilliant. It never occurred to me that, you know, she couldn't walk or really just sort of this was how Rowie was, and she lived in the children's for two years, which was about, you know, two years longer than they thought she'd have. And so from the ages of three to five, my life very much revolved and all of our lives revolved around um, being with Rowie and holding our family intact. And we were then never a normal family again, and that's got its, you know, deep tragedies when, when she passed away two years later. But also it leaves you with lots of stories about, especially as a child, about what you could have done and what you should have done and what I should have done and what I could have done. Well, that's kind of what I wanted to ask you about. You told yourself a really unfair story off the back of your sister's passing. I think it's a common story for both adults, grieving adults and grieving children. But yes, I did. And it took me a long time to realize that it was a story. Yeah. And it set you on quite a path, really. I mean, I, yeah, like your self-talk, your, your inner voice was really cruel mm. um, throughout your childhood and then through your teen years and all the way into your twenties. And that's the bit of the book. That's the only bit. See, I feel, I feel for you because that's the bit of the book you read. You haven't got to the good bit yet. Look, the truth is the first half of my life before I, you know, um, started writing songs that I would play in public and before um, I started doing what I do now with my life, it, it, it was a wonderful, full, but very complicated life full of what we now would call, um, you know, we now have names for things like generalised anxiety disorder or... Um, obsessive thoughts or, you know, this, for me, I was stuck in this rut of terrible guilt and it would play itself out through the way I used food and used diets, um, which again is really common, but it lodged itself in there, these stories that I wasn't enough and that I should have done something and I could have done something and I must do something with my life. I must live for two. I must make sure I'm safe. I must take care of my parents and, you know, I must not die. And this mm. became these secret stories that I didn't say out loud and they came to a head at 21 when I was in Oxford um, and a friend collapsed on the tube and it just triggered what I now know to be PTSD. But at the time I just thought, my God, why can't I sleep? I'm not eating. Why does everything feel so loud? Why am I shaking all the time? And I lost half my body weight and friends had to bundle me on the plane and get me home to Melbourne where I began a very long recovery from what... I can now call my one and only genuine, authentic nervous breakdown. Yeah. And Which you were by yourself pretty much, weren't you? Yeah, I was. My friend Libby, you might know her from Feeding Set fame. She was the French horn player in our first bands. But she was there and she she came and helped me 
because I was sort of stuck in a backpackers um, in a really difficult situation. And so <laughs> things get more interesting from there. You know, this was the 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 turning point for me asking, what do I want to do with my life? What stories do I want to tell myself about who I'm going to be? But it took me months to even just learn to walk around the block again. Because, I mean, for you growing up, I suppose, food was the, I mean, I, this part of the story stood out to me. Um, and I know it would Josh as well, mm. just because our sister had an issue with, with body image and food. And it was mm. um, the stories that you, you tell on the first sort of few chapters of the book, it was yeah. a very dominant in a voice for you. Yeah, chapter three up. is the is a story about um, always feeling big, even when I was small, too big, too much. Mm. And I was taller than the other kids, um, but I also just had too many feelings, so many feelings. I had no idea where to put them. And so my, a really, really easy way for my body to get some routine and regularity and safety and comfort was through the routines of food. So fish and chips on Friday nights, um, salt and vinegar chips in the hospital cafeteria, um, eating rowies, leftover food, all these ways of connecting with my family, you know, Sunday roast after after mass. And my body was obviously um, just unconsciously pretty aware of big ideas like death and dying and where do we go and what's the meaning of life and what is God? All of these questions were in me young and the thing that calmed them down for me was food. So I would overeat and I also had a really strong build and I was that sort of Germanic big girl who suddenly became called, you know, I had that nickname at school, um, which is about the fanciest title I have in this book. It's not a book about rock and roll, drugs and sex and fame. There's just a little bit of that, but not too much. <laughs> It's really about being fatty bomba. That was my title at school. And to join in, you know, to belong, I became a comic. And this weight issue was yeah, cause in, you know, really difficult. I think you said in the book that you you found out a way to make sure the, the bullies were laughing with you rather than at you. So Correct. You, so you sort of played into that. Yeah, you have a modicum of control. And they, they say the best place to train as a future comedian is to be a fat kid at high school or at primary school. Do you survive that? You know, so that was that was the sort of groundwork. And all the while, I am i don't know what this bad feeling is in me. I don't know what grief is. I don't know what sadness is. I don't know if I have a right to... It's a heavy feeling you have story. throughout your childhood, isn't it? Correct. And I get this story in my head that I uh, that I'm bad and I have to be good. And you know, we can look at that now and say, well, you know, the kid had a, a touch of the OCDs or the kid had was dealing with some anxious thoughts. Um, I'm not a, you know, I think on the spectrum of normal, this is a, a normal part of the grief experience, which I, I could have done with some help around if only we had known. But I didn't know. I was a very, you know, I was a pretty good tap dancer. And <laughs> my parents didn't know, but <clears throat> they would have loved to have been able to help me. But what we all noticed was my weight. And at 10, I'd had enough of the teasing. And I said to my mum, mum, I'm done. I want to go on a diet. And she said, you know, how do you know about diets? And I didn't know. I just knew that in this world, as a woman, I was expected to be smaller and stay small. And if I could do that, I could win. I just sort of knew in my bones that this was how I was going to roll. And um, she said, you know, you're a, you're a peach, you're an Amazon. She was always trying to give me a different way of looking at my body. My, my, I used to call it my, my jiggly happy body and then all of a sudden it became this burden. And she said, okay, so we went to the diet doctor. And off I went, I came back the next summer, thin, tall and unrecognised by people who I'd grown up with around my life. And Jimmy, life. And Jimmy wanted to ask you out, the, the <laughs> boy you had a... <laughs> The That's boy you had a crush on in kindergarten. That's right. Oh, who told you to go away because you were to go too away big. Too big. <laughs> yeah. Stuff you, Jimmy. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> but I was so shocked when I got, you know, a mate of a mate asked me to if, to go out with Jimmy. I didn't say anything. So that quickly wound up, didn't yeah. it? It didn't happen. But um, it was really bizarre to suddenly be treated effectively as a celebrity in my own primary school just because I'd lost weight and I loved that feeling of belonging and when the mums would ask me to photocopy the diet I loved having something useful to do and um, I discovered adults are really curious about diets and this weight thing's a big deal so again it felt good inside me and it felt bad too you know in the why same, did it feel bad what about because I knew there was something wrong with it I was the same person 
fat and thin and I knew that. And the morals and the values I've been brought up with taught me that it's our outsides. Our outsides are not what, what matter. It's our insides. But the, and that's true. But you were being treated very differently. The world was treating me with, you know, some interest and intrigue and a level of attention that really I'd never had before. Mm. It was very, very confusing. So I spent a lot of my teen years um, waxing and waning with my, what I call my piano accordion body, trying desperately and secretly to stay thin for God's sake, stay thin. There's a panic inside me. Yeah. And that's that was, you know, there was a background of that, that I had no idea there was a relationship between my anxious thoughts and the way I was using food or that it wasn't that I was just really shit at diets. It's actually that I was, um, you know, that I was trying to cope with some feelings. I just had no understanding, no language around it. And mm. that was the setup for 21. Yeah. I went to London after a terrible breakup. I'd been working in a call centre. A Joffa. And Joffa, my ex-boyfriend, um, I was really humiliated by our breakup. And a voice in me said, it's because you're fat and you got to get thin. And I went Even up. though you thought it was the right thing to be doing, is that right? You, you, as in you thought you guys should be breaking up? Yeah, it was time to break up. But, but then he did it and that was a humiliating. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I didn't appreciate that, did I? So, no. <laughs> um, you know, I was just devastated, really. I, we really loved each other and we had a terrifically um, codependent relationship. We'd been together since we were 17 and I thought it was my job to save him. He never asked to be saved. Um, he, you know, it was just one of those ones. And it was all tied up again with grief, with wanting to save, with wanting to make a difference, with being terrified issues with drugs and, and that sort of thing yeah that, he loved yeah. it he loved a, a little a little bit of a chuff he just yep. loved it and I um, didn't realize then I had anxiety I, I can't smoke dope unfortunately it's um sorry guys don't bother offering me your joints because I can't do it um, 19 was the last time I had a chuff of anything and I had a massive panic attack and I always had so I realized you know, I was pretty. I was playing in bands from seventeen. I was the straightest person in rock and roll. I'll tell you what. <laughs> um, so it wasn't for me, and it scared me the the amount he smoked. And you know, I thought it was my role to save him. And he's like, "Dude, you got some issues of your own." And you know, we broke up. I went to London, and that's where I've left you in the book, in the in kind of the darkness. But I can assure you. I can assure you that I did not stay there. It's a, it's a terrible time for me to put down the book. And I, and <laughs> I did it because you were coming you into the, the my... sorrow in his eyes as he's looking at me. God, it's, just, it's I terrible. I thought I'd give you a big hug when I saw you, even though oh, it happened a long time ago. It was 1996. 20, 22 years ago, 23 years ago. Yeah, but it, it's, but yeah. it seems like from what I can tell, this was your low mm. moment. This is your where everything turned around for you, really. Your mental health spiraled. Yeah. Pretty badly. Which brings us to why would you tell this story? You know, why, why, and I haven't told this story um, before because I knew there would be a point where I would want to tell it. And I knew at 21, as I recovered from, um, really, really did recover from what was a, a horrifically debilitating experience and Can came we, to terms with it. Is that right if we talk about what happened in, in London? Yeah. In we, what, what you went in Oxford? Yeah. Let's is go in, back there. In, I suppose just the. the the um, physical things that were happening to you yes. as a result of mentally what you were going through. Which I thought were all just, I was just losing my mind. I had no idea that actually when our bodies adrenalized, when we're oversensitized, we're not sleeping, we're not eating, um, we're shaking, we're, our heart's racing, we've got palpitations, um, feelings of unreality, surrealness, um, you know, sensitivity to light and sound. I had no idea that these are actually just normal, common reactions to uh, our survival. You know, these, these are our survival reactions. My body thought it was under threat and um, I was, was pumping a bit much adrenaline through my body. Once I realised that, I was halfway there to, to curing, but it went on for so long and I, be I grew thinner and thinner and iller and iller. And there were panic attacks and is that They right? were panic attacks. Yeah. It was like 24-7. There was no not panic attack at a certain point. You know, I was lucky if I got three minutes a day where I remembered what it felt like to be my old self. Like I, I really went there. <laughs> you know, yeah. I didn't go by halves and I just didn't know. I didn't have any name for my experience. Yeah. And 
when I got a name, you know, I, I came I came back to Melbourne. Do you, if we was there anything else? No, I just there was one other thing I wanted to just ask about. You had a realization. Sorry, I feel like I'm, I'm like <laughs> digging into this further. Sorry, you <laughs> no, go for it. Tell me to stop whenever. Not you want. at all. Um, no, I'm, it's been. I'm, I'm. I'm. It's good for. It's good to talk about. I want to talk about it in its detail. Yeah. Because I think there are people still suffering out there who oh, don't realize that. There is a way through. Well, actually, there are people walking around simple. right now who are going through what you went through in 96 and this would be yeah. amazing for them. And I love you people and you're going to be okay. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, there's a couple of simple techniques that, that maybe we'll get a chance to, yeah, to chat about. We definitely yeah. will. Yeah. We definitely will. Yeah. Um, uh, you had a realisation when you were in London that Rowie, your sister, was actually gone. Yes. Yeah. And that is where it, it opened up mm. a pain inside you which you hadn't felt before. Correct. So the psychologist Jean Piaget invented a term called the the age of magical thinking and it's generally thought of as around five to seven and it's where the membrane between fantasy and reality and, you know, from a brain development point of view, it's it's when your brain is still um, forming its early identity and if during this time, this early childhood time, um, you go, you experience some trauma, the theory is that um, you're still halfway in this age of magical thinking. And Joan Didion wrote a brilliant book about grief called The Age of Magical Thinking that popularised the term. But um, really what had happened to me in that trauma of losing Rowie was I was I had convinced myself that she wasn't quite dead, that she was actually hiding, which sounds insane, I do realise this. But one of the ways that I coped as a kid, um, I, I didn't go to her funeral, which was quite common at that time. It w- was thought that funerals are actually too traumatic for young kids. So it was, you know, early 80s, late 70s. So I'd always thought some part of me had hung on to this magical thought that one day she was going to turn a corner, that she wasn't really gone. And, yeah, in the dark night in Oxford as I was woken up again and again by the other girls in my dorm slamming the door and this had gone on for you know a long time and I was I, it hit me she was she was really dead so you're there 21 then nothing I could do about it yet okay. yeah and this was what you know under the we can now look at this from a adult or a, a modern perspective and say that these were all symptoms of PTSD this was part of the me trying to process trauma but I had no framework for that. All I knew was I was alone in a foreign country where they spoke my language, but I felt like a stranger. And I thought I was terrified that some I was going to harm myself somehow, you know, that this thought would swallow me up, that I would not survive, basically. Yeah. And that's what I'm up to right now in the book. Fucking, oh my God. And I'm very happy to know that you did talk into this. <laughs> well, you can see me. I'm here <laughs> yes. in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. So again, why do we talk, you know, why, why do we talk about that? Look, to be honest, it's a story that if I'd read that at 21 after my breakdown, if I'd read someone else's experience of that, I would have found it overwhelming but also comforting because I would have wanted to know I was not the only one who went through it. But I was so unwell that I couldn't read you know, I couldn't, even just looking at words made me feel nauseous. And a doctor in the UK had said to me, I think you're depressed. Um, you know, you might have a virus. I thought I had a virus. I was sure I had a virus. <laughs> and she said, you might have a virus, but I think, Claire, you might also be depressed. It might be time for you to go home and, and um, you know, have some quiet time with your family, basically. Uh, and I refused to believe that. I said, you don't understand. I'm the life of the party. There's no way someone like me could be depressed. I didn't understand mental ill health. I didn't understand anything other than what I'd read about, um, you know, Virginia Woolf walking into the river with stones in her pocket or Van Gogh chopping off his ear or, you know, Sylvia Plath with her head in the oven. Like we had a very um, minimised perspective or understanding of the full spectrum of human experience and suffering and where mental ill health um, and the Venn diagram of what is a, living a human life sort of coincide. And I, I, I just qualify that because I don't think we are our illnesses. I really don't. I, for me, I think of them as weather patterns, as storms that, you know, it's really useful to understand if a storm's coming and w- where a storm is you know, hitting from and what the wind and the gale is going to be like and, you know, whether I need an umbrella. That to me is a diagnosis and it's very, very useful. Mm. But it's just a set of symptoms that pass through and so many mental illnesses are, we don't even know 
really the symptoms are so common in so many of them and we call them separate things but really it all comes down in my estimate to there's some human suffering going on um and my way out of that suffering was to start having language around it which happened when I came home a friend of my mum's had a had had a, a similar experience and I was so ashamed I didn't I didn't tell my friends. I didn't want anyone to know. And again, I was thin again, you know, and I, and I, I didn't want to go down the street and people go, oh, you look great, Claire, because I felt awful. This dream I'd always had to be thin again. And there I was, and I was miserable. I, I wanted more than anything just to survive to the end of the day. You know, it was just the panic attacks were, were um, tripled and quadrupled on top of each other. And I had no... Nothing, you know, no idea what was going on. What did that feel like for you? Panic fucking attacks? awful. <laughs> fucking awful. Like, what's, I mean, just the worst. Just what the worst feeling. Like you, you, like something really horrific is or just about to or just has happened, but you don't know what it is. Mm. I have no way of remembering what it is. It's like being in a nightmare. For me, it was like being in a nightmare, but it was full sweats, shakes, racing thoughts, um, uh, catastrophizing thoughts. And it all ended when I realized what it was I was going through. I got a framework for not fearing the fear anymore. Mm. And that was through a book called Self-Help for Your Nerves by Dr. Claire Weeks, who was this pioneer, this old-fashioned Australian stalwart who saved those soldiers from the PTSD, but didn't wasn't called PTSD. We just She called it nervous suffering. And I just happened upon this book. I really like that. Nervous suffering. And I went, oh, what? That's it. And she went through all the symptoms. You know, if you're feeling this, that and the other, I want to let you know you can recover. And here's how you do it. And her technique, I called it FAFL because I like to acron- acronymize everything. <laughs> Face, accept, float and let time pass. And I'm simplifying it here. Say it again slowly, sorry. Face, yep. accept, float and let time pass. So here's what would have happened to me in London. I'm walking down the street, I get the flutter of feeling of fear, of panic, of adrenaline. You know, maybe a car went past really loudly, comes the adrenaline. Then I'm like, oh my God, what's that feeling? And I get afraid of the feeling of fear and then I start shaking. And then I start breathing shallowly and then I've set myself into a panic mode. It's very easy to happen if you don't know what's happening. And I'm too tired at that time to be able to go, oh, Claire, you're panicking calm down, you know, take a deep breath. I didn't have any internal voice Mm. or way to speak back to the voice of anxiety that was playing itself out in my head saying, you're awful, you know, this is terrible, you're broken. So what reading that book did was help me to go, oh, my gosh, I have duped myself into these feelings and I'm going to float my way out. And that's when I started doing very small things, walking around the block and then running back again because I was terrified. Um, you know, f- at m- cooking again, doing little crafts again, little tiny things because life had felt pointless. I'd wondered, why am I here? What are we doing here? What a joke, you know. I started to be able to engage again with the reality of everyday life and the routine of everyday life and have a voice that went, ah, ha, ha, I know what this feeling is. And just to be able to play and at one point I ended up just naming that voice just randomly. I was trying to do a Jack Cornfield meditation, but even meditations would freak me out. It was all too intense, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was just feeling – I didn't really want to be ruminating internally. I needed to go out for a run, really, you know, all that adrenaline mm. in my body. I didn't understand that, but Dr. Weeks helped me explain it. And with just using very simple practical language. Um, so what did you call the voice? I called it Frank, and I think that was, you know, the exercise was called naming the emotions. Yeah. And I was trying to name my emotions. It just, you know, again, language warning, but it was just, I didn't know what I was feeling. It was just a clusterfuck of just everything. <laughs> like, what? It's just too much, you know, too much. Yeah. And um, I, you know, he'd say, name fear, 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 or lust, lust, lust. I'm like, oh, i got no idea. I just called it Frank. And when all of that emotion would come up, I started to realise I could go, fuck off, Frank, get in the corner. You know, I started to realise I had a higher brain, really, in today's terminology. The lower brain had been ruling the roost. I'd been falling for it. Actually, I have a higher brain. I have a, a frontal cortex. I have a, um, an ability to self 
direct and I've worked on that 21, 22, 23, 24. Executive functioning, yeah. Correct, you know, executive functioning, you know, and it was, I make it sound simple when I say it, but those two techniques, the FOF, fuck off Frank, and the FAFL from Dr. Claire Weeks, that was my road out of, and, and also to get a, great, a good therapist. I refuse to go to a GP and I don't recommend that. I think in today's day and age, you get yourself down to that GP and you go, I feel weird. And you you listen to them. And if they don't care enough, if you don't think they're giving you your time, you go to another GP. You find someone who cares. And that's what I would do differently now. Hmm. And I would get a night's sleep earlier, you know, but I was completely paranoid about most things. So my way through was foff and faffle. Yeah, getting a good therapist who could be like my ticking clock in a thunderstorm. It's a bit like with like with the therapist. Sorry to interrupt you, but oh it's, god, for God's sake, interrupt me! No. Like, oh god, the coffee's kicked in. I've been talking for two and a half hours. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, everyone. I'm so passionate about this though because it saved my life, and I promised myself I'd pass it on. It took me twenty years to find the guts. So yeah, the you must be so proud of yourself. Not at all. I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Well. <laughs> You, you Sorry. Know, having this conversation around resilience, you just finish your book too. You watch out, ladies and gents, and all friends, because we we're, were saying before this, I, I, like reading your book, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed about bringing my book out now. No. Yours is so beautiful. Um, oh, darling, God, not at all. I can't wait to read yours. And we will, we will hit some of the same people, but also completely different people. Totally, yeah, totally. Um, Which is good. We're having the conversation. That's the whole point of the book. Can we further this conversation a little? Well, such an important one because so many people, I mean, my wife, Penny, who I'm going to interview on this podcast eventually. I love the sound of Penny. She's great, yeah. Sounds like a queen amongst women to me. That's... Everything I've heard about this, Penny. Is, and especially the fact that your one of your songs is her favourite song ever. Right. <laughs> that okay, helps well, you. Doesn't hurt. <laughs> doesn't hurt. So, um, so, what'd she say? Well, so Penny suffered from... Um, I, so when she's eight years old, she starts having these incredibly obsessive thoughts that she doesn't quite understand and yep. it was that her parents wouldn't live through the night and so she'd go and yeah. check them three times Darling. a night. Yeah. Yep. And it wasn't until she was, I think, 20, 21 that she mm. properly understands what's sort of going on. And it's only recently that we had a chat with a psychologist. Mm. The two of us sat down with a psychologist so the psychologist could explain to me what Penny's OCD was like because even she was finding it hard to explain it to me. Yeah. I, I, every day I talk about yeah. mental health and I'm her husband, yet it was still a difficult conversation for us to have. Yeah. So she's got this beautiful psychologist called Andrea who who described, who facilitated the conversation and mm. I walked away from it feeling much closer to pain than I've ever felt before, mm. a lot more empathy than I've felt ever before. I always felt empathy for her. But, but, but the main thing I was thinking was that everyone, we all need to be talking to mm. therapists. We should all be chatting to psychologist, counsellors, whoever, but it is a bit like dating. Like you have to find the right one. You do. You do. And, you know, is, some relationships are forever and some are <laughs> some are fleeting but just as powerful. Yeah. If, you know, and some of us need to lie on the couch for, for years and chat three times a week and, you know, hats off to that. And some of us need two sessions with someone who gives us some practical techniques and that will keep us going for a while. But, yeah, a lifelong relationship with experts who can help is – Bloody two thumbs up to that. Yeah. Particularly in today's day and age where in Australia, if you go to a GP and you get a mental health plan, you are um, then entitled to a set number of visits with a qualified psychologist free of charge, you know. So that wasn't the case 10 years ago in Australia. I think take advantage of that. Well, I, I admire everything you've been through because it happened at a <laughs> at a time where we weren't having those discussions like we weren't talking about mental health and we weren't talking I mean you didn't know what you had no idea what was going on no I did until I, I did and I didn't need a hell of a lot of information I just needed to know a what you're going through is pretty normal that's you know you're actually not going to fall off the face of the earth you're having panic you can think different thoughts you can tell a different story about yourself and you can believe it you know I went oh wow that's revolutionary I had to practice it a lot there we go that got me started then I got to see a therapist and learn some more about my childhood and what, how grief plays itself out and the need to really separate and have a separate identity and allow my sister to be, you know, to have lived her full life rather than fully always fighting with how unfair it all was, you know. It was unfair, but it was her full gestalt, so accepting that. 
And then stepping into what was actually, I had a lot of dreams. I wanted to be a songwriter. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to live an amazing life. I told myself all of my life that those things were superficial and they didn't matter. And that was the voice of my fear, you know, to really go, no, to really be able to say, I actually really do want to do these things. I want to make my living telling stories in the world and connecting with people. Not that I had that language then. Um, learning a technique to tell fear to go away and to keep moving forward in the direction of what were my big fat dreams has been a bloody handy little thing, mm. you know, bloody handy. So if you're sitting in front of um, someone now who is experiencing anxiety and the, the panic attacks and-, and Was pups, it something I said? What, what, what have I done? <laughs> what, what, what a, no, if I was, yeah. yeah. If you're sitting in front of someone going through yeah. that right now and, and you had a couple of minutes- to yeah. try and give them something, yeah. what would you be saying to them? So it depends who they were, you know. If, if there was someone that I'd given birth to or was married to, I'd say, come here, let me give you a cuddle. Take a deep breath into your belly, big breath into your belly. I understand. I know you're feeling these things. They're just feelings. They're just feelings. So our feelings, you know, I'm very clear now that our feelings come from our thoughts and we think a thought and it, we believe it or don't believe it and we have a feeling based on that. And this technique of allowing our body to have the chance of thinking something that's not survival-based, not panic-based, really it's quite – if we start with a big deep breath and a few deep breaths, then we've helped our body a little bit, mm. you know. But here's the reality. We do not get to change our circumstances. We don't get to change the weather I don't get to decide who lives and dies. I don't even get to decide if the taxi comes on time. I don't really even get to decide my first thought, which might be a panic attack, and that person in front of me might be having that panic thought of something bad's going to happen or I'm going to do something bad or something bad's going to happen to me or the world is, you know, whatever that thought is. But we do get a chance to choose a second thought. And that's where practice and patience, you know, facing, accepting, floating, and letting time pass can be really, really helpful. What does floating look like? I don't, I, the other ones I understand. but Yeah, floating is one of the most difficult to describe um, or to you know imagine when you hear the word, but I'll explain it very simply in practical terms. For when I came back from London, I didn't want to leave the house. I was terrified to leave the house. I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but bad things, you know, and, and I didn't trust myself to be away from, from home, you know, um, and this was one of my... My, we all have our particular quirks and that was one of mine, you know, I was terrified of noise and sound and something happening. Um, so Dr. Claire Weeks, uh, I know her voice is like this because I've now heard her audio books, you know, she sold millions of audio books and she was derided before there were audio books, she had cassettes and she was derided by the establishment at the time. But her technique was so simple and straightforward. She said, we must challenge ourselves at a certain point. So we face that we're having these feelings or symptoms. We accept them. We're not fighting them. Float. Don't fight. So that might mean I'm just going to walk out the front door and I'm going to keep walking and I'm not going to tense up and create, you know, my shoulders are tense. I'm shallow breathing. I'm going to relax and just float down, down the front path out onto the street and I'm doing a sort of Hawaiian um, you are. Yeah. Yeah, movement now if I was yeah. a, a truly Hawaiian dancer. <laughs> but it was that kind of flow movement, just allow yourself to relax and go out the street. And when the panic rises again, you know, for me sometimes that was just to the corner. And then I'd have to run home again because the feeling would be too much. But allowing yourself to float through rather than tense up and just let time pass and slowly, slowly, slowly. So is it kind of like acknowledging – the physical impact it's having on you in a way, like Correct. And, and overriding that by it's doing really something It's really about physical. mindfulness yeah, and okay. um, remembering to relax your shoulders, relax your jaw. Um, it's a state of deep acceptance, but it's action-based. It's not a difficult action. Mm. It's a floating action rather than, a, oh, my God, I've got to get to the, you know, school meeting and what if I panic and, you know, what if I trip over someone and I, whatever those anxious thoughts are because each of our – you know, internal anxious thoughts or really our survival brain voice can get quite loud when we're in a sensitised state. And each of the stories we tell ourselves are different. But my stories, uh, what I needed to do was tell myself a story where things turned out okay 
And for me, that was this. I was 21 years old and I said, one day I'm going to be well again and I'm going to write a book about this experience and I'm not going to have to do it. I didn't need the pressure of, I've got to do it now, this week, be well this week. What I said to myself was, one day I'm going to write it and I'm not going to do it till I'm really, really old, like 40. <laughs> and I, it was so rude. And here I am, you know, and for me this this is a beautiful moment because I never needed to have another breakdown. I, I learnt this simple technique that has seen me through all of these years, two decades of parenting and living in the public eye and touring and I still get anxious and now I say, you know, <laughs> I'm fuck feeling off, anxious. Frank. Yeah, fuck off, Frank. None of your business now. Come back. Come back another day. Frank, I've just written a book. I'm yeah, busy. do you mind? <laughs> yeah. I do try to be kinder to Frank now. I'm oh, okay. Like, Come on, buddy. <laughs> but if he plays up, I'm like, you know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> Off you go. In the corner. So, so how do you feel? So, how do you feel now? Like, you look. So... Do I look right in? I've just come from the salon. That's oh, why. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're going to say? Oh, my hair. You're going to get a photo of this hair. I've just had my hair done by Christopher. Oh, there you go. Yeah, well, you your go. hair does look lovely. Thanks. Hey. Sorry. Sorry, um, I interrupted. No, no, that's all right. No, but I, I just want, I mean, you, you look like someone who's who, who's just achieved something really special. Like you've just, you've set out to. You've got that glow. Happen. I don't know. You just, you just, Josh, am I, is that perfect? Yeah, good. Okay. Hair is also Yeah, thanks, yeah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> new hair, new dress. Um, yeah. Thanks for saying that. Look, I've had a good night's sleep and I did have Josh's wonderful coffee. But I think, you know, when, when I walked in, you're one of the first people who's read my book and you said to me it meant something to you and you said to me, even though you stopped in the worst bit, which is the middle, you've got to keep going, yeah. just keep going. Um, you know, that, that, if that glow of, of um, if you, you're seeing a, gl- a glow in me, it's a part of me that's going, good, I'm so glad that it meant something to you and I, I really want it to be useful to someone, you know, I put, um, yeah, I, I, I want people to know that recovery is possible, living a good life is possible, having big dreams is possible, and you take your time. Has it has it triggered stuff for you along the way? As far as has it challenged your mental health in the process of writing the book? Isn't that the grand irony? Yeah, I got <clears throat> to the thank yous. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, not Sorry. Sure. When I went to write to the thank yous, I, I in the end of my book. Um, I said this, I said, for anyone who doesn't think they've got a Frank, try writing a book because then you will see. (laughs) Okay. Um, I really thought at one point, my gosh, I'm going to be 20 years from now writing a book about the breakdown I had writing this book. (laughs) Sometimes it was rough and it was tough and there was a lot going on during the writing of, of this book for me. I I gave up, effectively gave up my job on radio to complete this project, which I promised myself I would do. And one of my heroes, um, my dear friends, John Hedigan, who, who the, the book is dedicated to John and to Claire Weeks and to Rowena, to their grand legacies. You know, we were um, writing this book in between caring for John in in his last um, few years of life. He, he passed away from from a brain tumour earlier this year. And so that's all, all of these things have been going on in the background. And the, the book has been the project that has kept me sane in some ways, but also kept me in that liminal space where I'm, I've had to walk my talk. I've really had to practice good self-care, um, intensive therapy, um, good walks, um, social connection, all of those things that keep me sane and keep you sane perhaps too. I've really had to practice them. Writing yeah. music for pleasure, speaking the truth, um, because yeah, going back there wasn't wasn't so easy. Yeah, of course. Well, congratulations. It's a, as, as you say, I'm halfway through, um, but it's 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 um it's beautiful. It's the most raw and vulnerable I think I've ever. Um, all the books I've ever read, it's the most raw and vulnerable I've ever seen someone make themselves. And should, should um, I take it back? No. <laughs> it's Which not I, too late. It's not actually you, in the bookshops. No. You've just done the audio book. I think it'd be a huge waste of time oh, to take that back. <laughs> I can't tell you how much it means to me that someone like you took the time to read that book and to, you know, half of it at least, and to invite me in here to ha- have this chat with your people. You make such a difference in people's lives. Now, we met on the radio. Yeah. And, you know, this. I know that you guys know the service you do, and I know it's not easy to 
be doing what you do. But um, yeah, hats off to you. Thank you. I don't. I hope this isn't too heavy a place to finish. But I, I think on. your older sister would be so unbelievably proud of you. <laughs> it's um, a beautiful thought. So thank you so much for joining us uh, on the podcast. And I um, it's it's been an absolute honour. It, really it is has. my honour. No, stop it. <laughs> do you want another coffee? Yeah, do. <laughs> okay. Come on, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> had a good time with you guys thanks for having me Pleasure. lots Thank of love you, lots of love to you all everyone go and buy the book <laughs> Thank you. can I be a fascination What a, what a, I want to read that book now. Yeah. I mean, maybe I read the second half and then you can just, you just don't have to. And then we can just exchange notes because it sounds like, it sounds like an incredible read. Yeah, it is. Yeah. What a life. Yeah. What a great person. Yeah. Now we'll, we'll, we'll go into some stuff in a sec, but before we do, so this is going to blow your minds guys. Um, so usually it's just Hugh talking to the, the interviewee. But in a pretty crazy change up of convention and format, um, Josh uh, Van Kylenberg, your brother, decided to jump in and ask a question near the end. I didn't see it coming. No one did. No one did. I was listening to the raw audio. I was like, well, this, I, I could see Josh eyeing off your chair for a couple of weeks. And, you know, good on him for not, for not acting on it, but he just couldn't help himself. And, we're so we're so beneficial. We're, we're, let me say that again. We're so lucky for the fact that he did because he asks a very good question, and I thought we'll just play that now, uh, and then we can come back and talk more. Well, I think for people who know Josh and myself, <laughs> Josh is a bit more of a deep, more insightful thinker, yeah. um, and so I could see his brain ticking away during the interview, yeah, just, and he couldn't help himself. He so yeah. possibly a new segment: Josh's insightful yeah. question. Josh's good question. <laughs> With like a 10 minute intro. <laughs> Just the sound of like microphones moving and like chairs shuffling as he like makes Done. his way over to the microphone. Done. I, I look forward to that in your really catchy jingle. In your... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's Josh's good question. Um, I think, hi. Hello. <laughs> um, this is exciting. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes when you hear someone's story mm. that's taken 10, 15, 20 years, mm. it can feel like it's a natural progression of events that all worked well and it all, once you made one decision, just led to all yes. these happy moments yeah. and then you end up, well, for, and magic. It's, just, it's just magic, magic and it all yeah. goes. But yeah. from my experience of dealing with issues, the reality is that it's sort of two steps forward, one step backwards for quite a while. And it yeah, can if be you're lucky, little, isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, so I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that. When I first came back from London, I thought I would never, ever recover. I thought I was so broken that there was no chance. I was 21 years old and I thought I was done. And I, you know, my hope was that I would just, as I said, get through the day. I learned a technique, a physical technique, just for understanding and framing anxiety. But that didn't take, that, and that allowed me to begin existing in the world again um, and begin, you know, possibly sleeping again and so on. But working on the the inner work, you know, the feelings that I had, the difficulties, that is my life's work and that continues. You know, what do we do with suffering? How do we turn it into gold? When we tell the story of it, it sounds really straightforward. But I've, I've got to tell you, you know, I, I spent from that moment forward, the first you would have heard of me was maybe, if, if you have heard of me, was seven years later when I released a song. But in those six years, there I was slowly, slowly, um, you know, I'd try to go to uni sometimes I'd still panic I'd have to go back to you know go sit in my dad with my dad in his office um I never thought when every every therapy session I thought what was the point of that going in and then I might come out with one little tiny granule of something that made sense and I feel rotten again the next day and think what's wrong with me then I'd try and remind myself of the techniques I was learning and it was so slowly 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 and I think it's such a good point to make that it it's not you're going to read my book, you're going to read Hugh's book, you're going to read our books and think it was all pretty straightforward and linear. It just wasn't. It's absolute chaos most of the time. But you can look back 20 years later and go, aha, what were the key, you know, what was the key to me getting well again? 
And it was this simple. I wanted to get well and I refused to truly give up, even though everything in me was tempted to give up and even everything felt so slow and like I'd never get there. And sometimes it still feels like that, but I know better. I don't give up. You know, I, I, if the therapist isn't right or the technique doesn't work, I try a new one. Um, and I write songs, you know, how lucky we are to have things like that. So the point being slowly, 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 it's not going to look neat. It's not meant to look neat. That's not what life is. And it makes sense in retrospect, but I, yeah, I just want to encourage you to not compare or think that our nicely polished books um, is what the journey looked like from the inside. It was really, I mean, holy majoli. I still sometimes pinch myself that we got here. Mm. Here we are, boys. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Beautiful. Well, thankfully, Josh did ask that question because it it's an amazing little extra bit there. Yeah, it was good because for me, um, and I suppose why Josh asked the question was there's a risk that people listen to the interview and think, so she wasn't well. She found some strategies. She put them into place. She got better. Yeah. Really important to acknowledge that it's, um, as Josh said, sort of two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. And you have days where you struggle and it's not just this clear path to really good mental health. And mm -hmm. I think that's a, I'm glad he asked his good question. Yeah. And, and it is, it's also just a reminder that no matter who you are, it's the whole, this is the whole point of this podcast, but even now, no doubt, Claire will be dealing with things on a daily basis, just like everyone is. Mm. And yeah, it's such an important thing to just remember that, oh, it's not just like, and this happened and then I was fine mm. and now I'm fine. Everything's perfect. Yeah, yeah totally. It's just so not the case. Um, so thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that really struck me listening to Claire that I want to talk to you about is the fact that she's now so self-aware of of her of where she sort of sits, of her mental ill health, uh, her struggles, and she's able to be so clear about how, like she's so eloquent in how she talks about it and what she struggles with and what she went through. Um, she's, ve she's, very, she's very capable in the fact that she can just name what she's feeling and she can just talk about what she's yeah. feeling and name her emotions, which... Is, which has obviously taken her a long time to kind of do and she's obviously done a lot of work on that. Uh, one thing that my psychologist said to me once a while ago, which I, I found really helpful, was when you're feeling like dark or when you're in bed and you can't get out of bed or you, you, you feel if there's any sort of depression and you're going through a, a state like that, then to observe what you're feeling as opposed to absorbing what you're feeling. Mm. Because to absorb what you're feeling, this is what she was telling me, means that it's like what Claire said. It's like your your feelings are your thoughts. Like your your thoughts create you can create your feelings, or at least amplify your feelings. And if you're just sitting there and you're you're in, and you're in bed and you can't get up and you just feel really dark and alone, and to to absorb it is the wrong thing to do. Because the more you absorb it and not talk to talk about it with someone it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that voice in your head gets louder and louder to the point where it's so convincing that it's the truth. And I just thought I'd just ask you about a little bit. So emotional literacy is the ability to label the emotion you're experiencing as right. you're experiencing it. Yeah. And it's something that we are pretty bad at as a whole. And when I say we, I think I kind of, I think I really mean males. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, I mean, yeah, I know what you mean, like traditionally it, is, it yeah. is males, but I guess women as well, like depending on the support group you have. Yeah, a lot depends on your upbringing as well. I mean, the reason I, I shouldn't generalize and say males, but the reason I'm saying it, if you are someone who struggles um, to label your emotion, there's actually a condition and that condition is called alexithymia. Mm. Um, a without Lexi words, thymia emotion. So, wow. um, and apparently I, I heard the other day that 80% of males in the United States have some form of alexithymia. Ooh. So it's really common. I heard that on a Ted talk, um, and we can, we'll put that in the link like we always do yep. in, in the notes, in the show notes, yeah, thumbs up from Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, but so, so many of us experience this inability to label the, so the reason, so first of all, the reason I think we struggle particularly in my health somewhere like Australia, to label the emotion we're experiencing is because traditionally, and now I'm not saying my upbringing, Josh and I were blessed to have a beautiful dad who, who didn't do this to us. But a lot of the time, 
if a young boy is upset or crying at home, traditionally the dad will say, come on, stop crying, be a man, don't be a girl, that kind of stuff. Yep. And so the message to a young boy who's Chin really, up, kind yeah, of that kind of stuff. So yep. the message there is that, okay, well, if I want to be a man and I, and I don't want to be a girl, I need to not cry. And so yep. all of a sudden we start switching off. We don't identify what our emotions are because we have been taught that it's a sign of weakness or whatever. So we don't do that. And then yeah. things go wrong throughout our life. We get upset and we sort of push it to the side and we go, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Or even 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 the fact that it – what it, what it also could just say is depending on how you've been brought up, even if you're being told, oh, come on, it's all right, you'll be right, Just right, let's just move past it, then you're just learning that this is the wrong thing to do to be sad. Yeah. To be upset and that's, that's bad, so I need to get through that as quickly as possible. Totally. Or just not talk about yeah, it. Totally, totally. And so we don't identify with the emotion. And I think in Claire's example, she didn't say this, and, and I'm not saying this is definitely the case, but it's very possible that she – the last thing she wanted to do was create any more drama for her family with what they've been through. So mm. she's feeling upset. I don't think she's going to sit down with her mum and dad and say, I feel really upset at the moment because they've already <sighs> been through enough. Yeah, They've already dealt with enough. The last thing she wants to do is to create more drama. So for her, potentially and hypothetically, her position is, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, you know, I'll get through this. And, mm. and it's nothing compared to what's happened with my sister. So for whatever the reason, we sort of don't tend to stop and pay attention to our emotions. And this is a problem because when we get older – things go wrong. And if we can't label the emotion, it's really hard to work our way to work it. Well, for example, um, you might see it a bit with, I'm using males all the time because I just feel more comfortable doing that. But say there's an issue in a relationship and the, a, and, a, and someone says to their male partner, are you okay? And they say, I'm fine. Mate, all good. Yeah, exactly. And that's no, usually how they say it. <laughs> yeah, all good, all good. Why? Why? <laughs> Mate, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly like that. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very good oh, no example. Worries, mate. All good. <laughs> um, Happy to help. <laughs> Anything else? And the- <laughs> no, you just call me here if you need, mate. <laughs> and and the reason we do that, we brush it, is because we don't know how to, we don't know what we're feeling. So the reason it's important to be able to label your emotion is this. If you are feeling jealous or you're feeling lonely or you're feeling hurt, to be able to say, oh, I actually feel lonely, mm. it's quite easy then to be able to take the next step and go, and by the way, this is why I feel lonely. And then Mm. to work out a solution to that problem. So I, uh, in 2014, a while ago now, I did a lot of work with a group of kids who are in and out of juvenile detention. Um, It's a really troubled kids and uh, terrific kids. They just had some really awful life circumstances. And I remember I would often go into these boys, they were just boys I'd work with and say, how are you feeling? And and I'd say, um, there were two two words I'd use to describe the emotion. Mm Mm-hmm. This is one-on-one. I'd say, how are you feeling? And they'd say, they'd either say, I feel shit or I feel depressed. Neither of those two are emotions. Mm-hmm. So I'd say, no, no, I want the emotion. And I'd say, no, I told you I feel shit. I said, no, no, I, I want the emotion. So, And I'd take in these, like um, all these um, emoticons, like these cards with faces on them. And I'd say, point to the face that you feel. I remember one day I said to the boy, how do you feel? He said, I don't know, I feel shit. I said, no, no, what emotion? He pointed to this face and I said, oh, let's turn it over and see what it says on the back. And on the back, it said lonely. And I said, mm. it says you feel lonely. Do you feel lonely? And he said, I guess so. And I said, um, no, I want you to say it. And he said, uh, I feel lonely. And I said, okay, why do you feel lonely? Told me like that. He said, I, I, well, mum and dad don't come to visit as much anymore. And my mates from school never come and see me. So, yeah, I feel lonely. And I said, but, but the thing is, he couldn't tell me why I felt shit. I said, why do you feel shit? I don't know, I just do. Why do you feel lonely? He told me straight away. And I said, oh, okay, yeah. so... So what's the solution here? What can we do? And we worked out a few things you could do. Well, one of the things was you could, you need to make some connections in this place here because you're going to be here mm-hmm. for a little bit. Um, so couldn't tell me what the emotion was, couldn't work out what the problem was, we couldn't fix it. As soon as he told me what the emotion was, uh, we worked out why he felt that way, then we worked out how to fix it. So that's why labeling our emotions is really, really important. And, and Claire said in that interview, one of the things she did with her therapist was to label the emotions as they popped up. It's a really important question to ask someone, I think, when you're having a, when someone's opening up to you and they're talking about what they're going through, to be able to say, how are you feeling right now? Mm-hmm. And if they give you an answer, I and mean, there's probably a lot of mums listening to this and thinking, well, this is my 16-year-old son who never talks. Yep. Um, you, I think you need to be a bit creative. I mean, maybe it's a, maybe it's someone dealing with a partner who doesn't like opening up, mm-hmm. but just saying, if they do it, start to open up and you say, how are you feeling? And they, and they give you a word that's not an emotion, like, I yeah. know, lit. <laughs> lit. <laughs> I was trying to think of a positive one. <laughs> <laughs> which, which emoji is lit? 
Just the sunglasses one or something? I think it's the fire one. I think that's the... Oh, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, was trying, I thought that was being really negative then. But... This is the lamest conversation <laughs> ever happened. So, so what's the lit emoji? <laughs> God. But, but on the topic of emojis, that can be a really powerful way to break through. So um, it can if, if it's, I don't know, I'll get no idea. Stop asking me that. Just go, well, what what emoji or what or what, or what emoticon or what, yeah. what um, emoji would you use to, to, for you right now? Mm-hmm. And then I choose it, look at it and go, well, what do you reckon it is? And get them to try a few different words. Because, I mean, that's, it's when you're, when you're a teenage, especially if you're a teenage boy, it is, it's hard to speak to your parents. Yeah, really hard. Because and I don't, there's, there's a weird block there. Yeah. And I even find it in myself sometimes now. And yeah. I'm 38. Yeah. That weird block. And I don't really know what it is. And I'm so aware of it. But sometimes I just can't like kick it. Well, so often that question is what breaks the ice that, that gets you to a good place. Because they're mm-hmm. going to answer if it's um, lost, unsure, um, whatever it is, whatever emotion they tell you. The next question of why um, it's usually not that hard for them to answer. Well, they mm. might know in their head at least. Yeah. And even if at least in their head that that starts ticking over. That's good. Yeah. And then you can say to them, well, we've got to work out what to do about that, whatever's going on right now for yeah. you. So emotional literacy is a really big one. And we don't talk about it anywhere near enough. Our, our school curriculum, it's a big part of our school curriculum, which mm. I'm really excited about. We've got 110,000 kids around the country this year doing our curriculum. And I, I get really excited about that because I know there's 110,000 kids around the country who have been doing lessons with their teachers on emotional literacy all wow. year long, which is really cool. And how so, old are they? Uh, prep all the way up to year 12. So that's incredible. So, so five-year-olds up to 18-year-olds. So then, so then such a, I mean, obviously, it's such an obvious thing to say, but such a big part of emotional literacy then is learning from a young age. And to understand, to, just like you, you learn a language, it's kind of like that. And like yeah. learning like that, that's just like a normal thing to talk about. Yeah. And uh, Josh and I were so lucky because our mum just always asked us what emotion we we're feeling, always. Wow. Well, from a very young age. I, 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 um, I don't know where she learned this or, uh, uh, yeah, who knows, but she, because um, I don't think in her upbringing she was asked that question, but for some reason instinctively she asked us a lot and I feel like my Josh and my sister Georgia and I have got good emotional literacy. I think a lot of it comes from our parents. Mm. So for parents listening out there, really important you ask your child how, how they feel and then why they feel that way. And you don't need to give them advice off the back of that. You just listen to them. And that I mean, that's also goes for, I guess, people in relationships. Like if the person yep. that you're with is, is struggling in a way, then to to talk in, in a way which like an, an open way and give them the opportunity to speak openly about their emotions and to label the emotion. It's, it's always talking about anything like that is strange. If you've never done it before, because it feels very foreign and kind of can seem just vulnerable, yeah. really vulnerable, but it's, but it's, it, it takes both people or especially if you're not the one struggling, if you're the one helping your partner, talk and label the emotion, then it's just so important that like you play as much of an important role as they do. And, and, and the other important thing on that, and that's very true, is to not just use it when times are tough or they're going through something really hard. Um, asking the question, how do you feel when, when they have good news as well, mm-hmm. um, is a really powerful thing to do as well. Yeah, Penny's gone back to uni. She's doing social masters in social work and um, uh, she, she's very intelligent. She's very good marks. And, and I... Um, she was telling me and I was thinking, I really want to give her the best response here. And I, and I asked her how she's feeling. And we had this lovely conversation off the back of the question, how are you feeling? It's a great question to ask someone when they give you good news because yeah. you allow them to relive it. And that's a really powerful connection to have with that person. So this is not doesn't have to be uh, for a really you know difficult emotion. It can be something that's really mm. lit as well. Yeah, something that's lit. Yeah. 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 I can't believe I yeah, said we that say before. Lit. We all say lit. <laughs> <laughs> What's a big deal? <laughs> I can't. I think it would be great to want if you if you and Penny ever went on the Amazing Race together or something, and then you win, and you just like you you know she's so excited, and you're both like cheering, and you're just like label the emotion, Penny. <laughs> Penny, how are you feeling? <laughs> label it. <laughs> just give me a break here. I'm enjoying myself. Yeah, label the emotion. <laughs> Don't have alexithymia. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think emotional literacy is a big one for this country right now, to be mm. honest, like all the stuff that's going on and being able to label how we feel is really important. The second thing that you brought up in that, um, in your, in your question is it was sort of led to CBT. So what you said yeah. before was that, um, acknowledging your feelings or sorry, acknowledging your thoughts and then how they make you feel. Mm-hmm. 
So for one of the things that people will be asked to do when they go and see a psychologist, when they go and talk about issues I have, or one of the possible suggested ways of trying to help someone is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, if I could try and summarize it really quickly, and I'm very being very careful not to stray outside of my lanes here because I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm trying to stay in my lane here. But um, it is basically the basic premise is that um, we, it, everything starts with a thought and then that then creates a feeling for us. And then that'll often go on and dictate the way we behave. So an example could be um, if, I, if I'm cooking dinner and I'm pretty excited about it, cooking dinner for Penny and Benji and then I burn the dinner or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my thought and, and, and then my first thought from that is that I'm, just, I'm such a failure as a dad. Like I'm such a bad partner. I'm trying to just get down do something. Yourself. Yeah, get really down to myself. Mm-hmm. And then I come home and they're excited to see me and I'm in, and I, my actions are, my behaviors are, I'm down to myself. So I sort of snap at them and Penny says, oh, yeah. how come dinner's not ready yet? I kind of snap at her and say, well, I'm sorry, but uh, this happened. And, and then Benji wants a, wants my attention and I'm angry and I'm, I'm feeling like a bad father, so I don't connect with him properly. Mm-hmm. So that's how a thought I've had, I'm a really bad cook, mm-hmm. so I'm a bad father, has, in, has impacted my feelings. My feelings are I'm not a good dad and I feel really down to myself, impact has influenced my behavior. Behavior, wow. So cognitive behavioral therapy is where you basically, like you said before, you acknowledge the thought and you kind of intercept it there and say, well, it's just a thought. And it doesn't have to impact my feelings in a negative way. Mm. What's a different way that I can say this right now? And to me, it could be if I've burnt the dinner, I could say, and Penny's probably listening to this laughing right now going, you always do that. You're so bad in the kitchen. <laughs> in fact, I can't remember a time where you didn't burn yeah. the dinner. <laughs> yeah, I know why you chose that as an example. <laughs> yeah, it's affected your behavior cooking, that's for sure. <laughs> You're a terrible cook. So the way that if I get, and I'm, I'm doing this in a very basic way, but I, I go, right, I've burnt the dinner. And my first thought is I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a bad dad or I'm a bad partner. You've let them instead, down. Yeah, instead yeah. of going, well, I'm trying my hardest. And there are other things that I am quite good at. And the reason I've done that is because I've become distracted with something else that is quite important as well. I'm trying to do too much at the moment. That's me trying to be the best partner and dad possible. Mm-hmm. That's okay. I'm going to start again. When they come in the door, I'll tell them a funny story about how, do you know what? Dad's burnt the dinner again. So it's going to be a bit later than it was or something like that. Yes, and then okay, make yeah. a bit of a joke about it or... I've just intercepted the thought before it becomes a negative feeling. Yeah. Turn it a positive one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my behavior is more positive. So it's, I mean, it, it also plays a little bit into when we let our ego like control our behavior. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Because one great thing I, I heard recently is that when you know when your ego is in charge of what you're doing because you're trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong. Mm. And when, when you're trying to figure out, when you're, you know, trying to figure out the person who's right and wrong. Uh, that's your. That's completely your ego, as opposed to just letting it be what it is. It's like, well, I haven't done the dinner mm. um, because it got burnt, and now I'm annoyed at myself. So, if Penny comes in and goes um, again, I'm going to try and stay in my lane here. I'm, I'm veering very aggressively outside of it. Um, but if she comes home and says, uh, "Why isn't the dinner ready?" It's almost like you're hearing that. It's like you're accusing me of stuffing up. Yeah, and I don't want to be wrong here. Yeah, so I'm going to protect myself yeah so i'm not wrong i tend to bring up other stuff as well like you oh, might yeah. be angry about something that happened the other day and that's still because you haven't dealt with that that all of a sudden the argument you're having is so disproportionate yeah. to the actual issue that's in front of you because you just like you, you, you're just like clawing for status yeah, yeah yeah totally yeah exactly right and we have this psychological need for status as i think we've said before so yeah yeah absolutely spot on so um, I should probably say that for people listening going, I've never heard of this and I've got some mental health issues. This is great. This is going to fix me. It's not for everyone. Some people are so, you know, you, you've, you've got some really, this is, this is something you talk through with a GP or a psychologist to work yeah. out if it's best for you. And they will give you much better example and much better practical strategies than me burning the dinner yep. and then getting angry at Benny, Penny and Benji. But yeah. um, it's, a, it's a very common form of, um, of therapy. And it works for a lot of people. It helps a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I find myself doing it all the time in my head, um, not as a form of therapy, just working through stuff. So do you mean, so to put it really simply, as far, so what CBT is essentially is is, is realizing what you're... Realizing, paying attention to your thoughts. Paying attention yep. to your thoughts and not letting it uh, get the better of you and affect your behavior. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah because that's the flow on. It starts with a thought, then you have a feeling, and then that impacts your behavior. Yeah, cause, I mean, I, I, I feel like that happens to me all the time, especially when like if my partner jam if she comes home and I'm in a bad mood because I maybe haven't done enough work that day and like I feel guilty or annoyed that I haven't done as much writing as I wanted to 
So I feel like it's a wasted day. And then she comes home and I'm in a bit of a bad mood because maybe I was hoping to do more that night and now she's home and it's like, well, now I can't do any more work because you're home. You know, I let's let, and then, so what I've tried to do more and more, and I actually didn't even know this was called th- CBT, but I guess CBT, but this is what I've been doing is, is just as quickly as I can, just saying to her, I, I'm not in a good mood because of this, because I haven't done enough work today. Because otherwise what's happened in the past is she comes home to this really negative energy that I've got, or I come home and I've got this really negative energy and she might just presume that it's because of her or it's, mm. it's got something to do with her. So to just allay her fears or concerns that my negative energy is, to, is something to do with her, mm. that's where it can really explode and get really bad. And then it takes ages to bring it back down. But if you just, like you say, like when you name it straight away, it, it completely diffuses it. And then also it allows her to be able to help me. It's extremely disarming <laughs> um, for you to just say, yeah, this is how I'm... I mean, it's all, you know, this, it's a really nice conversation to have with our podcast theme about being vulnerable and mm. being imperfect. That's yeah. kind of what you're doing. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's so easy to do really because often the thing that you're in a bad mood about is not a big deal. No, it's not at all, yeah. But you've built it up to be a big deal and, and now you – and also like you're probably trying to kind of push the blame to someone else. Like I don't want this to be my fault, so let's make this your fault now. Mm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We um, – I think it's a – I love that you use the examples of couples because I think so often if you sort of – if you notice you're not feeling good and you're about to see a partner or there's just some tension there or whatever happened to – to stop and go, what's the thought I'm having right now, mm. and what's it, how's it making me feel? How can I, how can I redo that thought, or how can I, yep. how can I rethink this so it's a positive, um, positive feeling that I'm having, mm. so I have a positive mm. action. I think in a, in a relationship, I think that's huge. Mm. Okay, yeah. Um, but I mean, this is something that, that it, it obviously worked really well for Claire. Um, but again, it's not for everyone. It does work for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't want people <laughs> turning up to psychologists saying, yeah, this guy called Hugh taught me all about it. If, if you, if you like, yeah. if, if it's something you want to explore, especially not this guy called Ryan, <laughs> it's even worse. It, it, listen to Hugh. What I'm saying is probably rubbish. <laughs> no, no, you know, it's, I've, you've, you've given some really nice context to it. So, um, but I think. Um, if this is if you're having mental health problems and you're thinking I wouldn't mind exploring this, discuss it with a professional mm-hmm. um, because it, it it can be a really powerful tool. Or read your book, which is out now. You may as well just read the book. Yeah. Just read the book, and so you're saying. Um, that well, that actually, we should you- probably say read Claire's book. <laughs> read Claire's book, but what but what you're saying is if you read your book, you get all the answers and you'll be completely fine. That's that. I don't think I can say. That. No, you can't probably can't say that. Okay, <laughs> still a good book though. Still get something out of it. No, it is. I, w- I will. Say, I know I said it before, but all jokes aside, I know I've only read the first chapter, but it is. I, I just you just got to. There's get, a story I left in there which I can't stop thinking about, and I don't know why I left it in there. Is it's, it about me? No, <laughs> no. no well, I'm barely interested, but okay. <laughs> No, so people will see it if they read it. It's a story about chisels and I don't, I just, I saw it and we've got to take that out. It's such a boring story and I left it in there and I opened the book the other day to flip through it and just like, oh my gosh, I've got a book and that's the first thing I saw, just chisels and I went, oh no. So I just- What if, chapter's chisels? Chapter two. Okay. So it's early. It's just early. I'm just worried people are going to go, what a terrible story and put people it down. People love yeah. chisels. I know they do, but not stories about, anyway, when you get to the chisel story, just skip past it. Oh, okay. Oh, so, no, it's, oh, so it's you, you can just skip through. You don't need to like read it in order. Oh, you do, but just ignore the chisels bit, I think is what okay. I'm saying. That'd be great. Okay. So the second chapter in your first debut book, just you're saying, ignore it. I got to read the chapter, <laughs> but as soon as you see the word chisels about me sitting in a storeroom at my part-time job as a 20-year-old, okay. just you don't need to read that part. You could spend, I mean, you've got a bunch of the books here. You could just tear that out. I could tear that story out <laughs> if you're so Cross regretful. Cross it out with a texter. Yeah. Or just do heaps of signatures all over the, <laughs> the second chapter. Uh, well, another amazing chat. Like, Claire, what an amazing woman. Yeah, she's so good. And just so uh, generous of her to share that story in her book, but then also to come on our show. And Well, the three of us have said that we listen to this. We listen to the interview. Well, obviously, we do the interview, then we listen to it to sort of just individually to, to work out what mm. we're going to say. And the three of us all had a comment that we sort of were listening to it like it was already done and we were just yeah. – the other ones I'm like, oh, we should change that. Maybe we should change that. The, the Claire one just 
Yeah. I was like, oh, keep going. This is amazing. So, She's just delivered a perfectly formed, um, beautifully structured Which Josh podcast. is delighted about. <laughs> oh, yeah, Josh. She'll be editing for about five minutes. Actually, now that I've waffled on for about 100 minutes, you'll have to probably delete some of that out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the next episode, we can categorically say, will be yours. Yep. Um, and it's already been done. So it's one I look forward to releasing because I um, – I know we don't have favourites in this, but it would certainly. Well, look, you're 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 the reason this podcast has happened, and and um, I you're the reason. To... Well, no, we're you... the reason. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should have a song now. Oh, okay, oh, I'll quickly write one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's coming up. Um, I think we'll we'll wait a couple of weeks. Um, a bit more like of a, I suppose, like a Christmas edition or a December edition, maybe for the yeah. podcast. Or so. well, maybe more probably would make more sense for me as a Hanukkah edition. <laughs> A special Hanukkah edition of The Imperfects. <laughs> oh dear. So thanks for joining us for this one. We hope you enjoyed it. And we're sorry about the, the wait between Georgie and, and Claire. Um, we, we predict Ryan will be um, early December. Yeah, around there sometime. Thanks, Ryan. Ta-ta. Bye. It's Ryan. Um, that was great. Thank you so much. Really, like, really interesting stuff. And the chat with Claire was, was awesome. So, um, thank you. But you know how I was saying, you know, I said to you, you're the reason this podcast is happening. And then you said, no, you're the reason this podcast is happening. And then we were like, we're the reason this podcast is happening. Remember that? Yeah, it was about five minutes ago. Um, anyway, and yeah, I said that I'd write a song about it. Um, but I obviously can't write a song. I'm, I'm Ryan Shelton. What the hell do I know about music? Luckily, I know a guy called Shelton John, who was very happy to come in and just improvise uh, a song for us. <clears throat> so I don't know what we'll we'll do with this, but you know, take it away, Shelton John. You're the reason this podcast is happening. 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 No, we're the reason this podcast is happening. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Shelton John. Um, speak soon, Hugh. I haven't got a good sign off, but um, speak soon, Hugh. It's Ryan, actually. It's actually Ryan. To call back, press do two to reply. If this episode has triggered anything for you around mental health, we strongly recommend Lifeline on 131114. The Imperfects is brought to you by The Resilience Project. Produced by Ryan Shelton, Hugh and Josh Van Kylenberg. A very, very special thank you also to No Mono for generously allowing us to use Keep On as the theme song for this podcast.